Hi, welcome to Revive Music Podcast. We are nearing the end of 2021. What a year, and it's not the end. Finding hope, that's the theme of this month. I have a new guest with us today. Her story of finding hope is in one of the bleakest times, and it's just so inspiring. I want to say thank you, Amy, for coming on, being a part of the conversation. Amy also has written a book entitled Prayed Upon, which shares her story a triumph after abuse it's never easy to talk about these kind of things but i do appreciate being on um thank you thank you amy thank you well i just want to also share with those who are listening i don't know where you are what neck of the woods but there was a disclaimer i always say if you are in crisis please seek immediate professional help in the united states it's 1-800-273-8255 I know there are listeners outside of the United States, so I do encourage you to find what resources they are um, available. Um, you know, I I do find later on I will start putting in some of the other ones, you know, the ones in the UK and stuff like that, because I know listeners are listening from there. But with that being said, I always start off a quote, uh, Amy, because I know people have said it better than I do, and that's okay. <laughs> so Desmond Tutu says it. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. How do you read this, Amy? Well, you know, my um, website has a scripture that talks about expose the darkness all around Mm -hmm. us and be a source of light Mm -hmm. in the dark. And so for me, it's just, you know, rising above and being that example, I guess, or that kind of a beacon of hope yeah you know um i always like uh the idea of hope because people try to find um the right recipe or formula (laughs) what i mean by that is that hope there there has to be uncertainty for hope to actually be there you know if we if we know everything it won't actually be hope it'll just be knowing things yeah but um for me hope hope is in christ for me yeah and I, I say for me, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm of faith, but I do, I just, I just think back of Victor Frankl, the book. I, I always love his book, The Man Finding Meaning. Uh, we always think of sustenance as you know, bread or something, shelter. But he said that people who thought there was another day were the ones who survived. <laughs> the oh, hope really matters. Like he said, like people will go around cheering the people up in the concentration camps. And the ones that really survived were the ones who felt there was another day. And there's something about that. So whether you're faith-based or not listening, I do find that inspiring. And I, I want to kind of switch over to strength. You know, strength, strength is a funny word because I, 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 that's why we don't like, um, you know, the best team in, the, in sports because we kind of go for the underdogs because if the yeah. chips are all in your favor – they have all the best players. Like it's not real. It's strength, but it's not the strength we're really talking about. I'm really talking about the strength when we're plagued with uncertainty. Oh, ever since this COVID, everyone kind of knows what uncertainty is and how do we redefine boundaries. But when all like I like this statement, like when all you can say at the end of the day is that that was hard. I'll try again tomorrow. <laughs> It's kind of that simple sometimes, and I feel that sometimes provides the most strength. I'm going to ask, turn it to you, Amy. 
How do you define strength for your own personal experience, and what have you seen in others that has been inspiring as you move forward? Yeah, you know, strength isn't really what we think of, or at least not what I think of when I imagine, you know, a movie, movie stars, TV shows. Yeah. Strength is really more about, you know, getting up every morning, mm-hmm. um, putting one foot in front of the other to do yeah. the next best thing. Yeah. And I ask the Holy Spirit to show me, you know, show me what the next best step is. Yeah. And for me, strength is just following that, following God's lead. It yeah. doesn't always look like strength. It <laughs> may feel like you're falling apart and you're a disaster, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel for me, especially I came later in the faith, but uh, later in my life in the faith, one thing that was encouraging, you know, me being was everything around us changes and change is stre- stressful even <laughs> and, yeah. and if you ration if you kind of reason this out the one thing that i liked about reading the bible and going and being a church leader is the idea that god never changes in that concept and that in itself with everything yeah. changing around us can be encouraging at the very little at, at the very minimum and that really yes. um that one constant change that's why albert einstein actually coins the real measure of someone's intelligence is the ability to adapt to change because everything constantly changes. And yes. Jeff Foster kind of says it this way. I find it's kind of haunting how he reads it. He says, he says, leave everything undefined, including yourself. Befriend uncertainty. Fall in love with the mystery. Kneel at the altar of not knowing. Give your questions time to breathe and all the answers will find you. There's a lot like for me being a faith. I kind of read that in a different way. It's like a lot of times we're urgently wanting answers. And sometimes we just need to pause and be present in, in the concept of our faith is be present with God, be present in our in our faith and praying and all that stuff. There's something slowing down is there's something about it, being able yeah. to just pause for a moment. So what are your thoughts when you hear this quote? Oh, I am not very good at that. <laughs> I'm not good at slowing down. Nah, I'm, I'm good not. at talking to God. And I'm not so good at listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he would love to give me some answers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're sometimes a little bit too quick, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's sometimes I think it's hard for me to be still enough to hear his voice. Yeah, uh, it kind of reminds me of um, you know the many times if you read the Bible, just how many times urgently the people are in the story like, oh, I have a plan. Like, especially with the boat, they're in the middle of the the lake and they're just. The storms are brewing and they were panicking and Jesus was just in their calm. There's something about slowing down and actually, you know, with this uncertainty with COVID and everything going on, it's the idea of um, putting, setting boundaries in our lives, saying, you know, I need my time to kind of breathe and process. And in the context of faith and the faith basis, have time for God in your life if, if seeing that that's a positive out, impact to your life so I find that being able to allow yourself time <laughs> you know we yeah. urgently you know so um, Amy uh, has there been a time that you experienced or witnessed that was so that was so much uncertainty that was, and little to no hope what have you found that helped you through it all you know we've kind of been talking about but do you want to elaborate a little bit more with those listening that has helped you. Yeah. Um, do you want me to go into my story? Uh, uh, you could, you know, um, you could touch upon it. We're going to, you know, we, you could go into your story. It, it, we, it doesn't really, I think this will lead into the story. It'd be kind of weird to just stop here. So yeah, share us your story. We're going to go, um, you know, I was going to do this later, but you know, you, we mentioned your book. So we're just going to go here. Would you mind sharing a little bit of your story and what prompted you to write it? And then you could probably answer the, the question before yeah. a little bit better. So, yeah, this is what led me to probably my lowest moment of feeling no hope and mm-hmm. um, not wanting to live and not knowing how I would even survive the next day. And that is that um, I started seeing a therapist in 2013 and um, didn't realize that adults could even be groomed, but he was. Mm-hmm grooming me for abuse. Um, and I was able to get out about a year and a half later Mm -hmm. and I was so overwhelmed with shame and self-hatred that, that I stayed so long and I let someone mistreat me for so long and that I couldn't leave. And, um, and I was just so confused and I thought no one will believe me. I thought, 
I was the only person on the planet that ever had ever been taken advantage of by a therapist. And my therapist was also an elder in my church, which made me trust him even more. Yeah. And he came very highly regarded. Um, mm. He was a doctor. And yeah. so, yeah. You know, I can't imagine because a lot of times, unfortunately, we hold on to titles and we're like, oh, you know, this is a safe person. Right. You know, me, um, we're still human. You know, I, I, I was, uh, I'm a, I was an elder in my church. I was the first elder. And I just remember just, just, you kind of, you know, kind of see that um, people lean so much on titles. Oh, he's this. So he should know. But a lot of times we don't give ourselves the mind to say, hey, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't right. doesn't seem right. And title or not, we're still human and we need to be treated decently. And yeah. at the same time, I can't imagine the pain and the shame, the amount of shame. A lot of people don't come forward when this happens because of the shame. Because a lot of people, you know, when it comes to healing, it's messy. They don't want to talk about it. They're like, uh, this happened and they try to they try to sift through the uncertainty like oh this is why you know that doesn't help the healing right. starts with just talking about it and obviously getting the proper safe care that you need today right. yeah so, thank you so uh, anything else you want to share um I like the second part like obviously this horrible situation story happened right what prompted you to write it a lot of people will say i don't want to write it you already said you who felt shame well it's yeah. funny because when i first got it, I didn't, wasn't going to tell a soul. And then I realized I can't get out without help. And so I ended up going to my pastor and his wife and they helped me get out. And then that was going to be the end of the road for me. Nobody else was going to know about it. And mm -hmm. um, eventually, obviously I told my husband because he deserves to know. And I told a few close friends and then that was going to be the end. But, you know, I knew it wasn't right to just let it sit. It just felt so scary to yeah. let the public and the world know. But eventually, uh, with the help of a friend, got up the strength to report him to the medical board. Mm -hmm. And after that, I eventually found the strength to file a civil suit. And after that, I decided that, you know, I wanted other adult victims to know they're not alone. Yeah. And, you know, really, I, and I wrote the story because I wanted to understand what happened. I didn't understand it myself. So yeah. I didn't know how I could explain it to someone else when I don't didn't understand. So I wrote, wrote the books of it for myself. And then I realized other victims need this. And I felt so alone. I want them to not feel alone. And I also want onlookers and the rest of the world to look at adult victims with more compassion because yeah. it's really easy to judge when you're not there. But when you can, you know, I wanted to write the story so that they felt like they were sitting in my shoes and so they can see just how insidious and methodical it is and how you know, sneaky it is. Um, these aren't, you know, unintelligent women that are being taken advantage no, of. No, no, no. So, yeah, that's what I. I yeah, and I think. That's what writing it. Yeah, and you know, I just remember even my own um, journey. I, I they said journal. I'm like, I don't want to journal the stuff I've been through. Like, and obviously, it's different. And uh, you know, when you're recovery, it's different. It's easy to kind of label which one's worse and which one's not. And then if you have a bunch of people just comparing how bad their life is, it doesn't help. You know, like really, um, I needed a journal, and I journaled because it was a safe place, non-judgmental. I'm writing what is going on and what I'm feeling, and I'm just like, there's something about this because I feel a little bit like release. Some of the things that I was saying, nothing solved, much. Right. <laughs> nothing solved, That's but right. it feels better. It does. I, 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 I facilitate some groups, and what I found even before I was in the faith, I, I found that people, three women, like you know, domestically violent, they're just uh, they've been abused domestically. They come together in a safe place and they share their story. Nothing changes, like on the surface on outside but they feel better and a lot of times they do better because the the idea of communicating and sharing is very healing you know um yeah. having a and voice is healing alone. yes yes of course it's so brave of you amy for coming here and sharing what you already did um i just want to also um 
just commend i i always i would never minimize any of my guests who come on and you know the question we had before you know um it, has there been a time obviously you shared that time and what what have you found i know you mentioned the pastor and the, the wife what else have yeah. you found that helped you through it if you like to share um i did realize that i was going to need to seek therapy even though that was terrifying yeah it, my the issue was just too big for friends and family to handle and so I did work with a therapist and I did EMDR therapy for a year and that was helpful. Yeah. Um, I found a website that is the acronym is TELL and it's mm -hmm. Therapy Exploitation Link Line. Mm -hmm. But if you Google like therapist abuse, you'll probably find TELL. And if you reach out to them via email, they have a lot of, um, they're called responders, but they're other adult uh, women victims from all over the world and they'll write you back. And so at the beginning, I really just needed to know I was not the only one on the planet that this had ever happened to. That's all I wanted to know is that I wasn't the only one and that I wasn't a loser because that's what I figured. Um, and so that was really healing in the beginning. And they would um, end every email to me with, you're not alone, it's not your fault. And I just clung to those words in that first year. And then really I had to address um, the self-hatred and yeah. the really the self-hatred that I'd had all throughout my life mm -hmm. up until that point. Yeah. And, you know, that self-hatred came with a lot of lies that I was believing about myself. And in yeah. my book, I call them rules. They're just old rules that I was living by that uh, made me vulnerable to predators. Um, you know, such as people in authority don't make poor decisions, don't make yeah. wrong choices, you know, the problem must lie with you, things like that. And I make them sound absurd like that for, for a reason, so that we can, when we read it, we can hear how absurd it is that we're believing these things to be true, yeah. you know, and that we're thinking of ourselves in this way. But so what I really had to do is address those. And the way I did that was just because I like to write, I wrote love letters to myself as if God was writing them to me, but I wrote them yeah. in the form of poetry. Mm -hmm. And I wrote them and wrote them and wrote them. They kind of just poured out of me until I could really feel God's love and acceptance break through that wall of shame and self-hatred. And I think that's really where my true healing came from. And that's where my true hope came from, because without that, nothing mm -hmm. would have really been different. I mean, I would have gotten over this assault, but I would have still been left with the same broken rules and yeah himself. and i feel when we hold on to those rules we can be can become can become bitter because if those rules don't fall in line we're like well then there's something else wrong and then the list keeps getting longer yeah you know um uh you know you mentioned a lot and i think faith you know faith is one of the things where it's hard to describe you know hebrews 11 1 is like it's what you uh, faith is what we don't see you know it's it's yeah. you know, I'm the idea is in the very beginning i remember doing a group this week and one of the persons like yeah well i don't agree with that hebrews 11 1 because i know that alcohol i'm like yeah but in the beginning you did it in the beginning in the beginning when you start making that first steps and that's a journey of recovery i do I do commend you, you know, coming, um, sharing and, you know, I do, you know, when it comes to, um, uh, this, this, um, this idea of, um, you, you say you write, you wrote to God. I did that too, but differently. You did? I, I, what I, I did that. was I, I wrote out my prayer to God and then I wrote what God would respond. Yes. <laughs> it was really kind of cathartic. Yes. <laughs> and it it was very, yeah. And it was like for me, because a lot of times, especially me being an elder, I, I work with, you know, people who are like, well, maybe were in the church and they know a lot of should have, should have, should have. Yeah. And then what I, what I realized is how they view God kind of really kind of was the foundation. So if it's hypercritical, that's how they're going to live and how they're going to treat everyone around them. If God is distant, you know, they have, but the benevolent, the loving kind of, you know the the god that we see in the prodigal son he runs to his 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 the son that squandered all his inheritance the one who leaves the 99 and goes for the yes. one that yes um, the one thing that's interesting is um and I, I usually don't like i know a lot of my listeners there's 50 50 but i i feel for me the idea and the moral the kind of 
lessons can learn can be transcended whatever you're wherever you are in your faith because i remember the pharisee praying at the versus the the i don't know pharisee and the gentile he's like god please thank you for not making me this 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 <laughs> yeah. and i was kind of hilarious it's kind of like what you're saying like these kind of rules but that pharisee was doing exactly the same thing because he saw it so black and white but it's not that you know these things are horrible that happened to you amy and i'm sorry they did i can never Thanks. imagine the, uh, even even beginning to heal from that but I, I i'm encouraged by hearing your story that you are moving towards the right direction you're yeah. moving towards and you're you're having a voice a lot of times in groups one of the biggest things i don't feel like i'm hurt and that's why i started revive ministries it's not so much like i everyone here is an expert it's not about being experts it's about sharing topics that are hard to share and i really commend you for being on thank you anyway i was going to ask you any final thoughts you'd like to share with those listening um you know anything uh today anything that you wanted to share maybe there's someone who's on the fence maybe someone who may have been abused or maybe they're just struggling to even open up or even get the help they need what would you say to them yeah well i have a lot i have a lot of things to answer to that one of them i really want to say is that even though it doesn't feel like it at the time that um, God is not the church and God is not the church elder. Mm -hmm. um, they are no representation of who he is, even though I know that is hard. Um, and as far as steps to take um, my website, I have as many resources as I can think of, you know, for victims on there as far as reporting, um, as far as healing, um, the tell website is on there. And really just knowing that you're not alone and that it's not your fault and that you're deeply loved. Those are kind of the three things that I really want other adult victims to know. I just want to say thank you again. All this information, including your website, Amy, everything, it, one, if they want to read your book, get more information or share it with those who they think may benefit, um, it will be in the notes uh, when this uh, episode. So scroll down you'll see it <laughs> i need to click on it and you'll be able to view and hear um more fuller her story i, I just know it's inspiring i'm just beginning to um actually read it myself so i, I really am inspired by you amy thank you. thank you for agreeing to be a, a guest of with course. us today i want to also share with those who are listening um and watching Stay updated with Revive Ministries at ReviveMinistriesFL.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. But I want to leave you with this last quote. This is goodbye from Revive Ministries 2021. This is the last episode for this year. But I want to say this one from Dale Carnegie. He says, most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying when it seemed that there was no hope at all.